Hi, good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN, and I'm honored to welcome you to an important conversation tonight between Deborah Turkheimer and Megan Tui. Thanks for coming. FAN is a nonprofit organization that presents a high quality speaker series offered free to the public on a wide variety of topics, including human development, mental health, education, and social justice. We have over 150 videos of past events archived on our website and our YouTube channel, so please be sure to explore. And now to introduce tonight's guests. Deborah Turkheimer joined the Northwestern University Law Faculty in 2014 after serving as a professor at DePaul University College of Law since 2009 and the University of Maine School of Law since 2002. She teaches and writes in the areas of criminal law, evidence, and feminist legal theory. Professor Turkheimer received her undergraduate degree from Harvard College and her JD from Yale. After clerking for Alaska Supreme Court Justice Jay Rabinowitz, she served for five years as an assistant district attorney in the, New, in the New York County District Attorney's Office, where she specialized in domestic violence prosecution. We are honored to welcome back Megan Tui, back to FAN. Ms. Tui was here in, last in November of 2019 for an in-person event at her alma mater, Evanston Township High School. Uh, she was discussing her book, uh, co-authored with Jody Cantor. She said, breaking the sexual harassment story that helped ignite a movement. Ms. Dewey is a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter for the New York Times, who has focused much of her reporting on the treatment of women and children. As a reporter with Reuters, she uncovered an underground network where parents gave away adopted children they no longer wanted to strangers met on the internet. And the series was a finalist for the 2014 Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting. While reporting at the Chicago Tribune, she exposed how police were shelving DNA evidence collected after sex crimes. In response to her articles, Illinois passed the first state law mandating the testing of every rape kit. And now, with no further ado, let's welcome Professor Deborah Turkheimer and Megan Tui. Well, thank you so much, Lonnie, for, the, for your words of welcome. It is wonderful uh, to be here this evening. Um, I'm honored to be doing this interview with, with Deb uh, about her incredible uh, book that just came out this week. Um, and it's just nice to gather together after these past 18 months of pandemic living, if only online. You know, it's, it's interesting, the last in-person reporting that I did before lockdown in March of 2020 was to attend Harvey Weinstein's sentencing in criminal court in Manhattan. And Deb, as I understand it, you also attended the criminal trial or a portion of it. And you know, the more I reported on it, the more I came to realize that that was actually a very unusual uh, case in terms of sex crimes prosecutions because the victims in the case had continued to have, by many measures, friendly relationships with Weinstein after he assaulted them and that prosecutors almost never bring charges in those cases, believing that they're too messy, that juries aren't, won't convict. You know, when you were sitting in the courtroom uh, watching that trial, how did you perceive the case? What stood out for you? Well, first I wanna say I'm thrilled to be here tonight. It's such an honor, fan host, some of the most amazing writers and thinkers, and I'm privileged to be added to that list. And to be in conversation with you, Megan, uh, you literally have written the book on the difficulty of bringing down one of the most powerful sexual predators. And it's, it's really um, just a pleasure to be able to talk through some of these pressing issues with you tonight. Yeah. On the trial, I was there when the verdict came down. I'd been watching the trial very closely from Chicago and absolutely agree that this case was unusual in many ways. I am a former prosecutor. I worked in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. I've been researching these cases for many years. And it's true that most of them never make their way to a criminal courtroom, particularly when they are, as you say, messy, 
when there's contact between the victim and the perpetrator, which happens a lot. I mean, let's be clear that this is not unusual, but it is unusual for prosecutors to be willing to bring these cases forward and to try to persuade 12 people beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a high burden of proof in criminal court. And for the most part, these cases just never get to a jury. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know that we are also coming off the heels of the R. Kelly conviction, uh, you know, just a couple weeks ago, which also feels like a very significant verdict in the Me Too era. I mean, I remember growing up there in the Chicago area and the open rumors about the R&B singer, how he would park his car outside of high schools, waiting to target underage girls. It, you know, it was like everyone just accepted that's what R. Kelly does. And I also remember his first trial in Chicago in 2008. I was a reporter at the Chicago Tribune at the time. And, you know, I actually remember that before that verdict in 2008, the journalists who were covering the trial took an informal survey of each other and what they thought was gonna happen. And every single journalist who covered that thought he was gonna be convicted. And yet he wasn't. And he went on, you know, as we understand it from the reporting in the criminal cases, he went on to continue to, to prey on women and, and escaped, you know, unscathed. Um, you know, what, what have you been observing that trial and that conviction? And, and what, what do you make of that? What do you make of the significance of that case? Yeah, absolutely. The cases have in common this idea that there's been an open secret about the abuse, that it's gone on for such a long time, that there were so many enablers, that so many people knew what was happening. And yet there just wasn't enough wherewithal, there wasn't enough will to bring this person to justice. In the case of R. Kelly, um, these were young Black women and Black girls and we have a history of overlooking harm to these individuals, more than harm to just about anyone else in our population. And so these are the most vulnerable, most marginalized uh, victims. And often we just don't care enough to do anything about their suffering. Um, this wasn't necessarily a case of not believing that the abuse was going on but just not having enough concern uh, to, to act. And I think that's, that's part of the problem here. It's, it's part of what we're talking about when we talk about credibility, not just believing that the abuse happened, but also believing that it was wrong, not the fault of the victim, but the fault of the abuser, and also believing that it matters. And we just didn't get that in the R. Kelly case for decades. Mm -hmm. And you, I mean, you talk about that in your book, you talk about other cases and this pattern of, you know, you talk about women in general, victims in general, um, not being believed and failing to, to and not getting the justice that they deserve. And you, and you make the point that, especially for black victims, that, that, that that's, it's even more accentuated. Um, and it, can, can you, beyond the R. Kelly case, can you talk a little bit about that, about you know, why Black victims have been sort of uniquely, have, 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 you, have suffered so much more than, than, than other victims? Yeah, if we take a step back and think about credibility as power, it's a form of power, and it's distributed along lines of power in our society. So wherever we see inequality, wherever we see uh, structural imbalances and power gaps, we're likely to see differences in how credibility gets meted out. And so I talk about the credibility discount, which is something um, that we see often when women come forward with allegations of abuse, but particularly where the woman is more marginalized or more vulnerable in our society, and I'm thinking about race, and I'm thinking about socioeconomic status, and I'm thinking about certain lines of work. And when women fall into those categories, their word is especially likely to be dismissed, uh, to be discounted. And then on the flip side, you can think about the, the powerful men who are accused and the bump that they get in their credibility, the credibility inflation that we see happen. And there too, power matters. And if we look at status, and if we look at 
who has the authority to speak about their lives, we're thinking about powerful men. And so that's why I think, for instance, the Weinstein case is, is such an example of a, you know, a person who was given this credibility bump throughout his career until of course that that changed, but it took so many women coming forward. One wasn't going to be, as you well know, enough. Right, right. You know, it's interesting. I, you know, I did reporting on sex crimes when I was a, when I worked there in Chicago, and I remember, you know, you talk about, uh, you know, you talk about uh, why, how, and why people aren't believed, and what race and socioeconomic status can how that can factor in and it makes me think about this one one of the big first sex crimes investigations that I did was about a doctor on the south side of Chicago a gynecologist and um, there were three women who came forward to the police um, African-American women who, who went forward to the police within two years to report that they had been assaulted by him in the course of you know uh, you know, regular exams. Um, one woman was pregnant, uh, and the one even underwent a, like a submitted to a rape kit. And you know, in all three cases, he denied it. And I think it took seven more women coming forward with allegations uh, before this, before the medical regulators did anything about it. And it wasn't until we published this story in the Chicago Tribune years later that the police went back and opened that case. And sure enough, the rape kit was a match to his DNA and he's now in prison. But to me, I just couldn't imagine how three different women, totally different back, you know, to from totally different, they, they, they didn't know each other, that you could, that you could be, a, you know, that you could be a detective or a prosecutor and, and you know, receive those reports and continue to believe him over the she said, she said, she said as they pile up. And, you know, that was certainly, it, it was just, and, and I couldn't help but believe that that, maybe I'm naive, but that that wouldn't have been the case if, if they were, you know, if they were a different race or if they were coming from different sort of socioeconomic backgrounds. It's horrifying and infuriating, and I wish it were an anomaly. I wish that these cases, you know, didn't happen with some frequency and they didn't happen still today, even in this Me Too era, but they do. And I write about some of these stories in the book and also about how women uh, know what they're gonna be up against. And it is often silencing. It's, it's often a reason not to come forward because the credibility complex, as I call it, is likely to kick into high gear. It's likely to disbelieve to blame, to dismiss, and that can be really devastating. And so many of the survivors I spoke to for the book explained why they didn't wanna disclose. And it's very much because they were well aware of this credibility discount that gets meted out regularly. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. I mean, if you're looking at the Weinstein criminal conviction and the Art Kelly criminal conviction as being two of the I think these are, are, are two of the biggest convictions that have come about since we saw the real shift in the Me, into the Me Too era, you know, over the last four years. And knowing that certainly in the case of Weinstein, that that was not a prosecution that normally would have happened because it would have been seen as too messy. And we know that in the R. Kelly case, he had been able to escape, uh, you know, he had been able to escape accountability for so long and that there too, there was a sign that the change in the culture was seeping into the courtroom. Um, there was a moment, I think, where the judge, there was the, the defense was pulling out all the old victim blaming moves. And at one point, I think going hard at a woman saying, you know, well, when you were 17 years old and you met Art Kelly at a concert, weren't you dancing like suggestively? And the judge said, cut off that questioning and said like, hey, listen, come, come into the 21st century like that. <laughs> That doesn't that doesn't go over any well anymore, you know. Like these, there's these signs, at least in these high-profile cases, that maybe the shift that we saw in the culture in terms of how victims of sex crimes and sexual harassment are, you know, that they're more believed and that they, you know, are receive better treatment. That 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 might be shifting into the criminal justice system. But outside of high-profile criminal cases, do you have a sense of if and how? 
you know, the treatment of victims has changed in the criminal justice system over the last four years in the Me Too era? It's really hard to track because we have this decentralized system. And if the cases aren't high profile, high visibility cases, um, it's much harder to get a handle on, on what's going on, particularly because, again, we know that most cases aren't making their way to a courtroom, right, right, not even right. being reported on as trials. Most survivors don't report. When they do report, police are not likely to make an arrest. And, you know, and so it goes. I will say that these high profile cases, I think, reverberate well outside the walls of the courtroom, and they do change the way we think about these allegations outside of the law, but they also, I think, change the way police and prosecutors are handling these cases. It's slow going, and I don't think any of us can pretend that this is going to sort of transform overnight, but prosecutors, I think, are more willing to be creative with their charging to take these more difficult cases, meaning cases that deviate from the stranger rape archetype that still kind of maintains its hold on the way we think about sexual assault. And so I think over time, we're going to continue to see this evolution toward a, a more fair, more just response. But for now, the, the first accuser is always going to have a, you know, a very hard time. The lone accuser, a woman you know, who doesn't have others to come forward with, these are going to be really tough cases, I think, until we start to correct for our credibility assessments and make them more fair, more accurate, more just. Mm -hmm. Right. And I mean, on the subject of credibility, you know, you talk a lot about all the credibility sort of discrimination, if you will, that victims of sexual misconduct experience, you know, at the same time, you also talk about how there has been this significant shift in the criminal justice system in which a conviction can actually rest solely on the testimony of a credible victim and that you don't necessarily need corroborating evidence that in a he said, she said case, a jury or judge can convict if they find the she more believable than the he. Can you explain when and how that shift happened and what the implications have been? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if that's a, a, been a change in law or a change in case law in terms of, you know, this, this, the fact that it just simply credible testimony can, can result in a conviction. So the corroboration requirement was one of these unique procedural hurdles that only sex crimes victims had to surmount. Um, this was baked into our law as a formal matter. Um, as recently as 1962, when what's called the model penal code was promulgated. This is like a blueprint for the states. It's not the law in any jurisdiction, but it kind of provides a template for, for state uh, legislatures. And as recently as 1962, when the model penal code was, was last drafted until very recently, there, there's a process of revision. This corroboration requirement was part of that model code. And it was there because the drafters were very clear. They were so concerned about lying, lying women, false accusers, only in this context. So proof beyond a reasonable doubt is there in every criminal case, but in sex crimes cases, there was a perceived need to make it even more difficult uh, for a prosecutor to win a conviction. And so there was this formal requirement, if there wasn't evidence above and beyond the complaining witness, the victim, the alleged victim's account, it would never reach a jury. It couldn't even get to a jury for a jury to decide if they were persuaded by the testimony beyond the reasonable doubt. The case would get thrown out. Now, you know, starting in the 1970s, there was reform around that corroboration requirement. And now as a matter of law, those cases can reach a jury in, in every state. And yet I want to be clear that as a, as a practical matter, the, if a case were truly a he said, she said case, it is exceedingly likely that any prosecutor is even going to try, try to get a conviction in that case, try to bring that forward. The case is going to need corroboration. It's going to need evidence beyond the, the, the word of a victim. And that's where it's deeply upsetting to see investigations 
cut short, to see that officers early on in the process so frequently are just deciding that a case is, is, is not viable, that she's not to be believed. There often is, as you well know, I think more than just about anyone, there is corroboration out there if you seek it and if you're willing to go after it, but it takes work and it takes an open-mindedness about you know, believing the account. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's interesting in the, you know, once the Me Too movement took off, you know, the, the phrase believe women became very popular and, you know, became a real catchphrase of the era. And, you know, yet in journalism, it's, you know, we, it's our job to scrutinize allegations of any kind before we publish them. Um, you know, I always say that my, like I had an editor who had a sign over his desk that said, like, if your mother loves you, check it out. Um, so one of the things that we do as journalists in talking about our coverage of sex crimes is to make clear that we um, are, you know, that, that, that we have a process of due diligence and that we are seeking out corroborating evidence and um, following a particular sort of protocol before we publish those allegations. Um, you know, what in, in terms of, you know, what do you think about that phrase and how it should be balanced with the idea of due process that so many people like to point to? In the book, I talk about this idea that belief is not binary, that there are what philosophers refer to as degrees of belief. So there's a continuum of certainty. And depending upon the context, we might need to be very confident that an allegation is true before we act. And I'm thinking about criminal court where we have this high standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt because someone's liberty is on the line. We want to be that sure. In a civil context, in a court of law, we have a somewhat lower standard of, of proof, preponderance of the evidence, or more likely true than not. Police officers have lower standards for acting. And outside the legal or quasi-legal setting, we don't have those designated confidence levels. So you have um, a professional set of standards and ethical constraints that are going to frame how certain you need to be before you publish a story. When people are responding to allegations that come their way because their roommate is telling them what happened or their daughter um, you know, or their brother, right? There, we might have much lower uh, requirements for how certain we have to be because there what the person is asking us for is likely support and um, help with a journey toward healing. And so I think it's really important when we talk about belief to be more precise and more nuanced than I think the broader conversation uh, tends to be around these mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought it was interesting in your book when you you zoom up, zoom in on these specific cases and these specific victims, and you, you know, time after time, you talk to women who reported their the first report that they made of their um, violation was to a friend or a family member or a roommate, and in so many cases, the skepticism that they received there prevented them from turn, you know, making a report to the police or, you know, their employer or their, the, you know, you know, taking it to the system in any way. Um, and I wonder, I mean, it, it's just, a, it's just an interesting, it, it was just interesting to see that barrier of belief before you even get to the system. Yeah, there's a fabulous psychologist named Kim Lonsway, and she calls this moment of first disclosure, which, as you say, is normally to a, a trusted person, a loved one. She calls this moment a fork in the road because it really does dictate the, the course forward. And it you know doesn't guarantee that if that trusted person in the inner circle um, is validating that the police will be or that the prosecutors will be or the Title IX officer will be but you can almost guarantee the opposite, namely that if that reaction is not supportive, if it's not validating, it's unlikely that the individual is, is going to pursue um, a complaint, a more formal complaint. And I heard this often from the survivors I've spoken to over the years, you know, saying things that make a lot of sense to me. Like if my mom 
didn't believe me, why would I think a police officer would? Or if my roommate blamed me, why wouldn't a Title IX officer? You know, if, <laughs> if this person who I trusted didn't care about me enough to sort of support me, then why would I go to a stranger and ask for that kind of support? And so, you know, the one of the kind of animating forces behind the book is this idea that we can all do better in our daily lives with how we respond to allegations. And that actually can lead to cultural transformation and better systemic responses. Mm -hmm. And what, what, what is your specific advice to people who, you know, who, in whom somebody can confide such an account, whether it's a family member or a friend? or a coworker? Yeah, a lot of the advice is about kind of confronting our biases around this issue and correcting some of our misconceptions about abuse and abusers and how victims behave um, so that we can, you know, form more accurate judgments and really resist our, I think, tendency to, to blame, particularly where there's alcohol involved or there's contact maintained after the fact, as we talked about earlier, or even still today, somebody was dressed in a certain way. I mean, all of this gets really baked into our culture and our law, as I show in the book. And so it's going to take, I think, a very thoughtful, mindful reckoning with these forces before we can start to discard um, the, the myths, the misconceptions, the biases that are shaping our judgments even though I think most of us want to do right. I mean, this is sort of un unwitting for most of us. We, we, we think that we're being fair. We like to think we're being fair. And so I'm, I'm urging you know, people to, um, to take a good hard look at this issue. And I think that's how we do the rewiring we need to do. Mm -hmm. And in, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, as a reporter, I've obviously sat down and with many victims in the course of my reporting and I have, there are sort of certain guidelines that I follow in the reporter source relationship there and obviously wanting people to share their accounts and share them in, in the pages of the, the newspaper, but also not wanting to push them to where they, to, to do something that they don't wanna do um, in terms of coming forward. For, for friends and family and other people who, might be fielding these, these accounts. I mean, in addition to examining their own bi potential biases, you know, what else, I mean, is there anything else specific that you can, that, that people can or should be saying or doing in that moment um, if, they, if they hear such accounts from, from loved ones? I, I can tell you what I often hear from the survivors I speak to. And this is often what they didn't get from their friends and family members, um, which is as simple as, I believe you, this shouldn't have happened. Tell me what I can do. Tell me what I can do to help you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that really doesn't seem like too much to ask. And yet time and time again, people are disappointed by those they turn to. And the aftermath of abuse can be as bad as or worse than the abuse itself. And this is something that I think people don't often realize, but it, it really is sort of what my book is about is the aftermath and how we can make the aftermath better for survivors because it really can be devastating. It can be such a blow. And and I think here's why. When someone is abused, whether it's a sexual assault or it's sexual harassment, it's a terrible thing to go through. And I don't want to minimize it in any way. And yet what I hear is that's one person who did that to me. And when I turn to the community, be it my family or my friends, my university, um, you know, or maybe the police representing the state, and there I don't get validation. Well, that tells me something about my worth. It tells me about my place and my importance compared to his. And that's the message that I think can often just be so undermining and so deeply, deeply um, upsetting and wounding. Mm -hmm. You know, so often the defense is that it was consensual. And can you talk about 
consent and the definition of consent and how it's changed and whether it means different things inside and outside the criminal justice system? It does, uh, I think, mean different things. Uh, so I should back up a little bit and say that um, for, for most of our history, sexual assault was not defined by the absence of consent, but it was defined by the use of lots of physical force. And, and it was a crime that really was defined by reference to how much force was used to accomplish this non-consensual sex act. And so slowly we've moved away from that, although in about half the states, there's still this lingering force requirement. And that I think is a real problem because it's really out of step with, I think, modern understandings of, of sexual assault and why it's wrong and why it's harmful. Consent itself is often not defined in our criminal codes. And when it is defined, it often puts the onus on the victim to resist either physically or verbally. And the alternative, which I think many people are familiar with from you know, being on college campuses or reading about college campuses is affirmative consent, which says that unless the person does something to indicate um, that she or he wants to engage in this activity, it doesn't count as consent. One way to think about it is what is the legal meaning of passivity? What is the legal meaning of doing nothing? And for the most part, the law says passivity is consent. And again, that seems out of step with what I think most, most young adults are, are learning in high school and on college campuses and what they're being told about what, what consent really is and what defines it and what it means. Mm -hmm. And, and do, you, do you see that, I mean, how do you see that evolving? Do you think that, I mean, where do you think we're headed with that? I think the criminal law normally lags behind cultural understandings. And I think this is a place where we really see that. And so over time, I think as people become more accustomed to understanding consent in affirmative terms, we'll start to see adjustments in the criminal law. I should say there are some states that do have affirmative consent definitions on the books, and there is some movement in other states to get these kinds of laws on the books. So to your question, if I had to predict, I would guess that in the coming years, we'll see more law reform along these lines. Oh, that's interesting. Well, you know, as you'll recall, Weinstein was represented by Donna Rotuno, um, a former Chicago prosecutor turned defense lawyer who has made a career representing men accused of sexual misconduct. And, you know, I had a memorable interview with her on the New York Times podcast, The Daily. And she argued that the prosecution of Weinstein was evidence that the Me Too movement had gone too far, that the system favored victims over the wrongly accused, that the women were out for celebrity, that they should never have agreed to go to hotel rooms for business meetings and not have expected sexual advances. And, you know, at one point, actually at the very end of our interview, I asked her if she had ever been a victim of sexual assault. And she said, I have not because I would never put myself in that position. And which was, you know, to me, very striking and spoke to her perspective on victims. Um, and, you know, she wasn't the only female attorney who was by Weinstein's side over the years. Linda Fairstein, a former sex crimes prosecutor in New York, uh, defended him during our reporting, not in court, but in our reporting. You know, as did Lisa Bloom, the famed feminist attorney, you know, daughter to Gloria Allred. And you know, more recently, we've seen the organization Time's Up implode over revelation that the women leading it were advising you know, former Governor Andrew Cuomo here in New York in the face of sexual misconduct allegations against him. And my question is, what do you then make of these female attorneys and the choices they've made? I don't know if you overlapped with Linda Fairstein at all in New York when you were a prosecutor here, but... What do you make of them? Yeah, um, I talk about your interview with Don Rotten in the book, and I, I put it in the chapter on blame shifting and, and talk a lot about the, the, the impulse 
um, to protect ourselves psychologically by um, attributing <laughs> bad things that befall other people to their own actions and to their own bad decision making. The world is a safer place for all of us if <laughs> the world is just. This is the just world hypothesis. Uh, so that interview, uh, which created quite a stir and for good reason, I think is illustrative of this dynamic. And look, women um, drink the water and breathe the air of this culture. We're not immune to these biases. We're not immune to these influences. I would like to, to say otherwise, I would like to believe otherwise, but this isn't about bad apples or about people who are you know, necessarily wanting to do wrong. Some of the people you talk about, I should say, distinguish between the various women you asked me about. Some of them are, are, are serving a role. And so if you're defending Harvey Weinstein, you're gonna probably sure. see things. Um, the Time's Up story is a, a saga that I think is in many ways sad and you know, maybe a cautionary tale. But I think that's very different. And I think that the women who were involved in that um, were well-intentioned. But the larger point I think is that this is not something that breaks down neatly on gender lines. This isn't about you know, men disbelieve and women believe. It's just not that simple. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was interesting in the case of Lisa Bloom. I mean, I think especially for the women who have made their careers representing women and representing victims um, to, to cross sides is pretty remarkable. And, you know, we got this memo that Lisa Bloom had written to Harvey when she was kind of pitching her services um, uh, in which she basically said that she was going to use all of her experience working with victims to help you know, him work against his accusers. And she basically said like, I've worked with the I, you know, I've worked with these women and the more you, you know, the more you probe, the more like their lies become evident. And you really wondered, is, was this the perspective that she was taking away from years of working with victims? Was that how she actually really feels? I mean, had she come to take, have a genuinely pessimistic view of many victims who come forward? I Right. And you'll, I mean, you'll, correct me if I'm wrong here, but she had some choice words to say about Rose McGowan in particular yeah, right. and the ways in which Rose McGowan could be discredited. I think she even talked about the roses of the world. The roses of the world, right, yeah. Right, and you know that that's obviously a real problem to sort of take that approach, regardless of your role and regardless of whether you're pitching to Harvey Weinstein. I, you know, I, I think that that is a bridge too far or many bridges too far. But I, I guess what I wanna say is that those tactics are only effective if they find an audience. And mm -hmm. so if she didn't think it would work, if she didn't think that people who Googled Rose McGowan and found whatever story she was, you know, she was planting or she was amplifying, if she didn't think that those people would then disbelieve Rose McGowan or blame Rose McGowan or not care about what happened to her, then she wouldn't have bothered making the pitch. And so, you know, we're, we're all more implicated in some of this than we might like to mm -hmm. be. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Lisa Bloom and her mother, Gloria Allred, um, and other plaintiff's attorneys have made a lot of money steering female clients into secret settlements with their harassers or abusers. And in fact, you know, these out of court settlements in which victims accept cash in exchange for silence and their lawyers get a 40% cut have become the de facto way of dealing with sexual harassment in this country. Uh, what do you make of those settlements? Well, the secret settlement I, system. Yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously a worry that uh, powerful abusers will use these agreements to silence their victims. And at the same time, I have heard from attorneys who believe that the agreements have some value for their clients and are reluctant to give up that leverage entirely. So this is a place where I'd like to see um, law reform, and we've seen some in the Me Too era. We've seen some 
um, movement to curtail the use of NDAs, particularly up front. So as a condition of employment, I think that's that's the easier place to start. And then when it comes to the settlement agreements, I think that um, it becomes really important to try to get more power into the hands of the victim um, to, to sort of, you know, to give that person more leverage and not to take it away entirely. This is really hard though, because I don't think that everyone misuses the NDAs. And I, again, have spoken to some lawyers who truly believe that it was in the interest of their client um, because they didn't want to be public about this, because they wanted the settlement. And that's why the abuser agreed to pay because he too didn't want it to be public. So these are complicated issues. One fix is to <laughs> create a culture that is more receptive to these kinds of claims so that the notion of going public isn't quite so daunting so that it isn't such a big ask um, for women to come forward in a more public light. Sure, sure. I, it, it's just been astounding to, though to see how these, I mean, I don't think anybody would argue that, you know, victims don't deserve recompense, financial recompense for what they've experienced, but to see how these settlements were used by predators like Harvey Weinstein, Larry Nasser, you know, the list goes on and on to cover their tracks, right? And so that they could go on and hurt more people with the young women coming into their care or into their workplaces, having no idea that there was a trail of, of victims that came before them who were like legally prohibited from saying what had happened to them. That's right. And carrying this burden, I know for many, many of the women, many you've spoken to, many who I spoke to for the book, you know, that was a, a terrible price to have to pay. And over time it became un, unbearable and people would, would break the silence. It's also interesting that, you know, in civil discovery, for many of these victims, their entire pasts come in to play. And they're asked about everything from past yeah. relationships to past abortions to, you know, past social media postings. And yet these NDAs shield the men from being questioned about their past. So, mm. I mean, there's a clear inequality here that needs to be addressed. Mm. So that's interesting. So you're saying that, you know, your book talks about how in the criminal justice system, there have been changes to the law that that to prohibit that from happening in criminal court for victim for victims to be to, to to prohibit women having victims having to talk about previous relationships or sexual activity but in you're saying when it comes to sort of civil matters out of court matters that that can that can still be extensive that's yeah, interesting particularly, yeah particularly pre-trial discovery which is sort of wide ranging to begin with but the latitude that these yeah. attorneys are given to ask women about their past is astounding. And it's often a deterrent to coming forward because who would want that? Who, who would right. want to be questioned about everything? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I, I can't, uh, you know, I wouldn't be able to, to finish this interview without uh, speaking. I know that you are a professor at, there at Northwestern University, which has been making headlines um, for the demonstrations uh, that have erupted after several students said that they had been drugged at two fraternities um, and assaulted. And you know there are these protests that are playing out at other universities right now, and that there are some students actually looking for a complete overhaul of campus culture. Um, uh, you know, can you speak to your perspective on, on, on these uh, demonstrations and this, these calls for, for really sweeping change? I think sweeping change is, is needed. I mean, the incidence of sexual assault on college campuses is, is terrible and it should shock and alarm all of us. Um, and when you have a situation, uh, particularly where there's alcohol involved, I think our blaming tendencies kind of kick into really high gear. And so those cases don't tend to get sorted out really well. Many of the survivors I spoke to for the book experienced so much stigma and so much ostracization when they came forward with their allegations on campus that I, I do think that you know part of this protest movement is a call to rethink the entire culture around sexual assault. Mm -hmm. And I mean, how have, at the same time, there have been changes in how college campuses deal with 
you know, allegations of sexual assault. I mean, do you see, I mean, do you, do you, do you see that there has been change? You just don't think that it's significant enough? It's really a shifting pendulum. I mean, depending upon the administration, um, you know, how colleges and universities are being asked to respond formally mm -hmm. to uh, to complaints, I think is is kind of shifting back and forth. And we're going to see more of that in the months ahead. But I, again, would point to kind of the informal culture that prevents so many survivors, even from going forward with a complaint. There's There's such a anticipated credibility discount and the um, social implications of coming forward and being as you know one person said that girl right that's that's real that's real still today and this is where I think I would like to see more more progress mm -hmm. I mean are there in terms of calling for a change in culture you know how specifically do you think that can and should be done? Well, I think, you know, culture change happens in lots of different ways. Some of it is that we can change our laws, we can change our rules, we can change our procedures. And, I, you know, I talk a lot in the book about places where this credibility discount is actually baked into those laws and procedures. And those are fairly obvious places for reform and we can make those changes. But you know the rest of it kind of falls to individuals, and at the end of the day, who's enforcing these laws? Who's in charge of investigating and adjudicating, let's say, on campus allegations of sexual misconduct? Well, there are people who are subjected to the same biases and misconceptions that all the rest of us are, and so you know you'd want to see if you're talking about cultural change or transformation. You, we want to see people in systems and people outside of systems starting to rethink these allegations and to move away from some of those old um, kind of ideas about what sexual assault, what sexual harassment are, and the harm of them. Because part of the problem is that we don't, I think, care enough about the injury to the victims, even when we believe we are not as apt as we ought to be to place the blame on the perpetrator, often men who seem to have really bright futures and we care deeply about those futures. We over-regard, I think we express an over-regard for that individual. We don't want him to suffer consequences. And as a result, the person coming forward is left feeling as if she just doesn't much matter. Mm -hmm. So beyond the reporting system, I mean, I know, I, and I'm not sure if the suspension still stands. I know that Northwestern, I believe, had suspended recruitment and social events at on-campus fraternity houses. And some people, you know, have even been calling for just the entire Greek system to be shut down as a way to help shift culture. Uh, what do you think about that? What do you yeah, think about that? I think that th th those who call for this are rightly pointing to a real power imbalance on college campuses, that these fraternities are the, you know, the place where socializing happens, where the parties happen, where the alcohol is distributed. And, you know, that in itself leads to this host of harms. They're, you know, elite is another criticism, an elitist. And so, you know, I, I am I'm certainly a believer in having these more radical conversations about the function of Greek life and whether the benefits of it outweigh the very obvious costs. Mm -hmm. And what about the way that these issues play out in high schools? Um, you know, do you have any, what's your perspective on, on that? Practitioners describe high schools, secondary ed as the wild west when it comes to the um, enforcement of Title IX, which is the federal civil rights law that prohibits sex discrimination in public yeah. education. Um, th the response on the part of high schools, I think, is, is less evolved. I'm speaking generally um, as compared to what we've seen on college campuses. And so the, you know, the people who are really in the trenches doing this work, I think, are of the view, and this resonates with me, that we'll see a lot of change in the way high schools handle these allegations and the way that they do prevention in particular. Mm -hmm. You know, you've talked in the course of this interview, you've gone back and forth with using 
victim and survivor and you talk about that in your book can you talk a little bit about the the language you know victim survivor accuser um and what you see as the significance in those terms and the differences and how they're used yeah, thanks for asking that question. I do um, have an author's note where I explain that I'm going to use victim and survivor interchangeably in the book, unless someone I speak to has a preference for one or the other. This is to convey the idea that healing is often nonlinear. It's often a process that's incomplete. And so one of the women I spoke to for the book said something that really made a lot of sense to me. She said, you know, some days I feel like a victim and other days I feel like a badass survivor and I go back and forth and it wouldn't make sense to me to only be called one or the other. So, you know, that's, that's why I use the terms um, inter interchangeably. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, I mean, I've asked about sort of specific things with regard to the criminal justice system, but, you know, how much I mean, how much overall do you think has changed in the Me Too era of the last four years? I think a lot has changed. I think that the world cracked open, um, thanks in no small part to your work. Um, the stories that have been pouring out ever since the explosive reporting that you did on Harvey Weinstein haven't stopped coming. And so where that gets us is we become much um, more attentive to the realities of abuse. We, um, as, a, as a society, have conversations about it on an ongoing basis, and it can no longer, I think, be ignored uh, by the majority of, of people who pick up the newspaper, who you know, talk to their coworkers, talk to their family members. That has to count as progress. What I'd like to see is um, a better response to these allegations and a, um, a more fair credibility assessment when it comes to what to do when we hear these stories. But I absolutely believe that the past few years have brought us closer to real seismic shifts in how we deal with this problem. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'm looking at some of the questions that have popped up in the Q&A, um, and I know that there's a question here about, and I may be turning this over to, to the, some audience questions over to Lonnie, but before I do, I just want to ask, I, I think that there's, you know, there's, there's a question here about, and I know that this has played out more broadly in the Chicago area, about allegations of sexism and sexual harassment and assault at the like in the beaches and the, the lifeguard systems there um what's your perspective on that Deb? is that something that you've been following and do you see do, do you have any opinion on that i have been following and i think you know by all accounts this is an example of systemic failure. It's a, a failure to respond to credible allegations of abuse. And I think across the board, there's been an acknowledgement of that, but it took too long. And the question now is, you know, what, what do we do to keep this from happening again? And, you know, to ensure that those young women who came forward feel validated, feel vindicated, feel like what they said matters, that there's the kind of change and you know, culture shift that is needed to ensure that this doesn't happen again on the lakefront. Yeah. Well, I'm going to hand over the rest of the audience questions to Lonnie, but Deb, thank you so much for this uh, really engaging conversation. It was such a pleasure to, to be able to pick your brain and hear more about all you know, all of your valuable research and, and observations and perspective. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Megan. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. I've appreciated the questions and I've loved having the conversation. Thank you. 
Um, Megan, great job, Deb. Great answers. I love the back and forth. I had a feeling, and Megan, I like how you, you just like kept building steam and you were, I almost felt bad about coming back on screen. I'm like, okay, just let her go. Let her go ahead because I think you had a couple more in there. Uh, so we're just going to go with uh, audience faves here. So we're going to, let me just hop right in. Um, Michelle is asking, I heard a lawyer say that there's no such thing as a she said, he said case that that just means that the prosecutor hasn't done their work, that there's always more evidence. Can you speak to that, Deb? Yeah, I'm reluctant to, to use the word never or always um, because I am a lawyer, so I'm going to hedge a little bit, but absolutely, Michelle, I agree with the, I think the sentiment behind the question. He said, she said is, is often what uh, people say when they want to throw up their hands and protect the status quo. It's a way of justifying non-action. And, you know, and, and I think that, that that really is the problem. Almost always, you'll start to notice it, the he said, she said formulation is just a prelude to, so I will do nothing. And as an amazing psychiatrist uh, named Judith Lewis Herman has said, all the perpetrator asks of the bystander is that he do nothing. Right, and when we do nothing, we preserve all of the structures that are in place that enable this kind of abuse. Just so I have the right link on that, is that Kerman, K-E-R-M-A-N? Herman, H-E-R-M-A-N, -E Judith Lewis Herman. She's a psychiatrist at Harvard Medical School. Okay, good, we'll make a note of that. Uh, Gail is asking, Megan mentioned that journalists have a, proce a process to address credibility. I'd love to know what that is. What kinds of things do you look for before publishing a firsthand account in the sexual harassment assault context? Mm -hmm. um, that, yeah, I'm happy to answer that question. And um, so one of the things that we will ask is, you know, the first question is, you know, is there any documentation of, of, of what you're alleging? Did you um, either file a police report or did you file a report with your employer if the violation has been a workplace-based um, offense? Um, if not, did you ever, did you, did, did you, did you write it down in a diary? Did you, uh, did you send an email to a friend about it? Did you text with anybody about it at the time? And what we're looking for there is just, uh, and, and if you didn't, and even if you didn't, if there's no documentation, did you tell anybody at the time or since, um, this interview? I mean, not just like, did you tell somebody yesterday, but is there, is there a record of you? having confided this uh, in, in a friend or a colleague? And if so, then we're gonna wanna talk to that person um, for corroboration. And that can sometimes be an awkward part of, of reporting because somebody has poured out this, you know, sort of painful story from their past and just telling it alone can be difficult. And so uh, to then have the reporter say, well, okay, you know, I, to, to ask those questions that I just spelled out, I think can sometimes feel, feel, feel difficult, but it's not because we don't believe you. It's because we want to make sure that if we're going to publish that allegation, that it's as, you know, that we've done the due diligence and that there, that there's going to be some supporting evidence for it. Um, and so we do that, you know, I, I've, you know, I've done that with, we do that with everybody. Um, and it's not just, you know, so I was talking about the, you know, the women who were getting assaulted by the gynecologists on the South side of Chicago, you know, from, from, from those women to, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow telling a story about being sexually harassed by Brad Pitt, you know, I'm sorry, excuse me, by Harvey Weinstein, you know, when she said that at, <laughs> she's, but she said, I, 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 I'm slipping up here, but, you know, she said when she was telling me and Jody that story for the first time, she said, you know, that she had after, after this sort of really harrowing incident with him in a hotel room for a business meeting, um, you know, she had gone home to her boyfriend at the time and told him what happened, Brad Pitt. And so that was one of those moments where we were like, okay, well, we're going to have to, I hope you don't mind if we reach out to Brad Pitt to ask about that. And the reason we're doing that is to protect the accusers and to protect the journalism and, you know, right. also out of fairness to the, to the accused. Right. Thank you for that. I'm watching our time. We're at eight o'clock, so we're going to be closing out. Uh, I want to remind everyone we are doing an after hours. It's going to start in about five or six minutes. I'm going to give Deb five minutes in between when we finish. Uh, you can get access to after hours. We've been posting links in chat 
buy a copy of Credible. It's a fabulous read. I had the galley in the summer and I read it quickly on the beach. I don't think it took me more than three trips to the beach to read the whole book. It's really excellent, jam-packed, full of great, great information. Megan, thank you so much for your service to FAN and to the broader community. Yeah. We're very grateful to uh, replenish the connection here. Deborah, it's been fabulous getting to know you. I look forward to another hour spent with you. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We hope to see you uh, at more FAN programs. Did you want to say anything, Deb, on the way out? I did. I want to thank you, Lonnie. This has been a fabulous conversation. I feel fortunate to have it. Thank you to everyone attending. It's really been a pleasure. Excellent. Good. All right, everyone stay safe.